Welcome to Prognosis. I'm Laura Carlson. Today, we're bringing you a special episode of the podcast. It's a close look at how the novel coronavirus lived before it entered humans, and who it lived in. Bats. They are almost certainly the source of this pandemic. But they may also hold the clues to stopping the next one. Scientists have learned that the new coronavirus shares 96% of its genetic makeup with a virus previously detected in a kind of bat, known as the horseshoe bat, from the Yunnan province in China. It turns out these bats are virological treasure troves. So many of the infectious agents we worry most about coexist in virtual harmony with these nocturnal creatures. Bloomberg senior editor Jason Gale takes us back to the mid-1990s, where a surprise finding by scientists in Australia led to the emergence of the Bat Pack, a group of researchers who not only discovered a whole genus of dangerous viruses, but found what could be the precursor of the novel coronavirus. They're also laying the groundwork for potential treatments. Here's Jason. The story of bats and viruses can be traced to an Australian veterinarian, Dr. Hume Field. The son of a policeman, Hume grew up in various parts of the northeastern state of Queensland, where he developed a fascination for Australia's native fauna. Uh, I'd always had uh, an interest in animals, and I guess growing up as a kid, I can remember uh, my parents saying, oh, Hume loves animals, he's going to be a vet. And this was really a bit of a throwaway line because nobody in our family had ever been to university, let alone to a five-year veterinary course. But but nonetheless, the sort of seed took hold, I guess, at least with me. When I caught up with Hume, he was in his home office in a leafy coastal area southeast of Brisbane. You could hear chattering wildlife and vocal pets, as well as drought-breaking rain. Hume graduated from the University of Queensland in 1976, He worked for a couple of years in a small animal practice, but his interest in wildlife led him to pursue further study in the evenings, first in environmental science, then a doctorate in the mid-1990s. It allowed him to combine his love of native animals with emerging diseases at a time when the state's agricultural authorities were trying to figure out the source of a deadly horse disease. It was a virus that infected 20 racehorses stapled in the Brisbane suburb of Hendra in 1994. It's thought to have started when a mare called Drama Series was brought to the stables after she'd been grazing in a field at Cannon Hill on the other side of the Brisbane River. Drama Series died two days later, and subsequently all of the other horses fell ill. Thirteen of them died. What was especially alarming about this disease was that it crossed the species barrier. A trainer and another person tending to the horses became ill with a flu-like illness within days of Drama Series' death. The stable hand recovered, but the trainer died of respiratory and kidney failure. The virus was eventually isolated and named Hendrovirus after the suburb where it was found. Hume was asked to help determine how a drama series might have caught the virus. He went searching the paddock where she'd been grazing and presumably had become infected. He caught rodents, possums, feral cats and reptiles and tested them for Hendrovirus. When the results came back negative, He went searching for clues via the people rescuing vulnerable wildlife. Here in Australia, they're sometimes referred to as wildlife carers. So we subsequently broadened our search and started using wildlife carers as a a conduit, if you like, to be able to collect samples from sick and injured animals that were in their care. Uh, And it was in that process, so again, quite serendipitous, that we actually... Sample. We were sampling kangaroos, we were sampling possums, we were sampling the usual things, ducks, a whole range of things that would come into wildlife carers. Uh, and there were flying foxes, and we sampled some flying foxes. This was over a period of months. And lo and behold, uh, we found antibodies to Hendra virus in some flying foxes. So we looked at some more flying foxes, and then we looked at some flying foxes in, uh, uh, in captive uh, populations at zoos, etc., and, and that's how we identified um, flying foxes as being, at that stage, 
uh, a possible reservoir. Then we went on to do further studies, eventually uh, detected an isolated virus, et cetera, et cetera. And so now flying foxes, or at least a couple of species of flying foxes in Australia, uh, are recognised as the, the primary reservoir host of Hendra virus. Flying foxes aren't actually foxes. They're a large fruit-eating bat with a kind of fox-like face and expression. They weigh up to a couple of pounds and their wings can span more than three feet. The finding of Hendra virus in bats was important not just because it helped identify the pathway by which horses and people were being infected. It also made scientists alert to other viruses bats could potentially carry. About a year after Hugh made the discovery of Hendra virus in flying foxes, another opportunity to explore the ecology of viruses in bats presented itself, this time in Malaysia, where pigs and pig farmers were getting sick. By mid-1999, more than 265 people had fallen ill with encephalitis or inflammation of the brain. Of those cases, 40% were fatal. There were also 11 cases of either encephalitis or respiratory illness, including one death in neighbouring Singapore. Scientists found the viral source. It was named Nipah virus, which it turned out was from the same family as Hendra virus. Hume was asked to help investigate the source. I wanted someone who, was, uh, who might be able to guide uh, and work with them to find out the natural reservoir of Nipah. So knowing that we knew about Hendra and bats, then we... Uh, immediately focused, not exclusively, but we certainly focused on flying foxes in Malaysia. Uh, and it wasn't too long before we found evidence of, um, of uh, Nipah virus in species of flying fox there. Just as Hendra virus did, the discovery of Nipah underscored the risks that emerge at the interface of wildlife, farm animals and humans. Professor Trevor Drew is the director of the Australian Animal Health Laboratory at Geelong, just outside of Melbourne. It's carried out key research on both Hendra and Nipah viruses. According to Trevor, the emergence of Hendra and then Nipah identified the ways in which bat-borne viruses can spill over and infect other species. And Nipah virus was a disease also of uh, fruit bats in Malaysia initially, and uh, that virus uh, got into pigs because the, uh, they, were, they were starting to put pig farms into more forested areas and the faeces from the bats uh, got into the pig styes and, and was thought to have infected the pigs that way. And it killed hundreds of, uh, of pigs, if not thousands of pigs. Nipah isn't just confined to Malaysia. Over the past decade, it's caused outbreaks in India and Bangladesh that have killed dozens of people. We also now also also know from uh, uh, incidents in Bangladesh of outbreaks of Nipah virus that you don't need the pig; that the uh, that the bat can actually also infect humans directly via drinking out of uh, vessels of palm sap that are uh, put onto the tree to uh, to harvest the palm sap. And uh, people drink this palm sap, but so does the bat, and they will come down, and the saliva from the bat can contaminate the the palm sap and infect the human. Directly, so we know that uh, that that is one incident. But certainly in Malaysia now, they're very very careful not to have pig farms uh, near bat roosts. An even more dramatic outbreak occurred just a few years later. Severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, emerged in southern China in 2002. It's a deadlier cousin of COVID-19 that quickly spread across the world. Hume Field was asked to help investigate its source. And because of our experience with bats uh, and uh, hand virus and Nipah virus and you know, a growing awareness that uh, there seemed to be something special about bats and uh, these spillover viruses, then you know, we hypothesised that bats may play a role in the, um, the origins of SARS. And so we went down that track. It's interesting to reflect on the significance of the discovery of Uh, species of bats and flying foxes as the natural reservoir of Hendra virus Uh, because really that finding, uh, I think, has potentially coloured the identification of bats or, 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 you know, sort of underlying the identification of uh, various species of bats being associated with, with this suite of other emerging diseases that we've seen 
over time. If we had the group plan- that Hume just referred to also includes Ebola viruses and lysivirus, which causes rabies, as well as a number of coronaviruses, including SARS, and most likely the one responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic. So what is it about bats that makes them such great virus vectors? Bats are are quite unique uh, if you think about it in terms of them being a mammal that can fly. So so, um, bats are mammals, they produce milk, they suckle their young, uh, but they've got this amazing uh, evolutionary um, adaptation or ability to be able to fly, so they're highly mobile. They also typically live in large populations, colonies, roost, whether it's the big fruit bats or flying foxes, whether it's small micro bats in caves. And and typically these uh, groups have mixed species as well. Um, they're relatively long-lived uh, animals as a, as a taxa. You know, flying foxes certainly uh, recorded, I think, in captivity to live well into 20s, certainly wouldn't live that long in uh, nature, but certainly, you know, they live for years. Uh, so all of these factors are very attractive for a mammalian virus survival and dissemination, if you like. According to Hume... Bats have evolved and adapted to coexist with the viruses that infect them. And and so the thinking was that, well, you know, these are just viruses of bats and the bats are used to them because they've evolved with them. And that's why the bats don't get sick with these viruses. But if they spill into other naive, immunologically naive species, then they have a dramatic, typically a dramatic uh, and often fatal infection. But more recently, people have dug a bit further to try to understand if there is indeed something else going on with bats, and it seems that that there isn't. Hume now works as a science and policy advisor with the EcoHealth Alliance. It's a New York-based NGO that works to protect wildlife and public health from the emergence of disease. Spillover events are becoming more risky. Bats, as we heard, are coming into closer contact with farm animals. But they're also coming into closer contact with humans. A key reason for that is that bats are losing their habitat. Critically, they're losing their natural food source. What you're hearing is the sound of grey-headed flying foxes roosting. It's dusk and I'm sitting on a grassy bank of the Torrens River in the centre of Adelaide, the capital of South Australia. I'm literally a stone's throw from the University of Adelaide, my alma mater behind me, and the Adelaide Zoo on the other side of the river. This is a popular place for the 20,000 bats hanging upside down from the eucalyptus trees above me. It's a familiar place for Dr. Mark Shipp, Australia's chief veterinarian who is based in Canberra, but also grew up in South Australia. Mark is the president of the World Organization for Animal Health. He told me that bats have taken up residency in Adelaide and other urban centres, but not by choice. Uh, almost every uh, city in Australia now has uh, a resident uh, roost of, uh, of flying foxes and the fruiting and the flowering trees that these uh, bats normally feed on have been largely removed uh, from uh, rural Australia. And so they've been uh, you know, forced in, into urban centres and suburban uh, parkland where there is uh, some flowering trees and some fruiting trees. But these are are not the preferred diet of uh, the the flying foxes and they're putting those flying foxes under stress. We've seen a number of incidents in Australia over recent years with large-scale mortalities of flying foxes due to heat events. Uh, Here in Canberra we had a large hailstorm event which uh, killed uh, over 300 uh, flying foxes. It reflects that uh, they're they're in centres where they would normally not be present and that they're under stress when they're in those uh, centres. There's another concern with bats roosting in places like this, where horses are being kept less than a mile from here. For us, uh, the the concern is that uh, where we have uh, parkland, we often have horses. And we know that uh, flying foxes can transmit uh, Hendra virus uh, to horses and that uh, those horses in turn can transmit that uh, virus to uh, humans. 
and that, and that's a fatal disease of both horses and of of humans. And then and then uh, that there is the the risk that uh, the the bats themselves will will transmit directly uh, to human populations. And there are a number of coronaviruses and other viruses that uh, bats carry and, and can transmit to the human population. But there are other consequences of the loss of bat habitat. While these animals can carry some pretty nasty viruses, they perform functions vital for the Australian ecosystem. They uh, play very important roles in terms of insect control, of pollination and of uh, seed dispersal. The, the role that they play in keeping down uh, insect numbers which you know, and, and insects uh, tra- can transmit disease, particularly in uh, northern Australia, is, is very important. And then the, the role that they play in uh, pollinating uh, plants uh, as they move between uh, plants and then dispersing seeds when they eat fruits and, and disperse the seeds so that those uh, plants become established in other areas is very important and is a role that no other uh, participant in, in the ecosystem can play. In the mammalian world, Lifespan is generally proportional to body size and metabolic rate. Bats defy both these rules. One bat species, weighing just 7 grams or a quarter of an ounce, can live for more than 40 years. It's one of a number of quirks of these critters. Professor Linfa Wang has been unlocking the secrets of bats since the 1990s. He was the scientist who isolated and characterised hendrovirus and identified its virological cousin, Nipah. Actually, it was Linfa who named the genus to which they both belong, Henipavirus. Back then, he was working at the Australian Animal Health Laboratory just outside of Melbourne. He now heads the Emerging Infectious Diseases Program at Singapore's Duke and US Medical School. For the past 13 years, he's devoted his career to studying bat biology and bat immunology, particularly its defence against viruses. He's brought a number of researchers along with him in Australia, Singapore and now China, where he was born and did his undergrad degree. In scientific circles, Linfa is sometimes known as the Batman. People give me the nickname of Batman. I try to correct them to say, I actually don't study bats, I study bat virus. Linfa serves on the World Health Organization's Emergency Committee, advising the Director General on the current COVID-19 pandemic. It's a reflection of the knowledge he and his 20-person lab have amassed on these animals. And we have been focusing on the question of why bats. Why bats are so different? Why they can carry so many virus and themselves do not get sick? And why bats live so long, consider their living environment and also the stress they have during flight and also the pathogen they're exposed is much, much more than a non-flying mammal. It turns out that the immune system of these flying mammals is different to that of terrestrial mammals. Bats react to infections at an earlier stage, arresting them before they cause any disease. That enables bats to avoid the damaging inflammatory immune response other mammals, including humans, often mount in response to virulent infections. So our current working hypothesis is that bats have a much better defense versus tolerance. Pathologists studying COVID-19 and other pathogenic viruses have observed that when the body initially recognises an infection, various white blood cells that consume pathogens and help heal damaged tissue act as first responders. In some severe infections, the body's effort to heal itself may be too robust, leading to the destruction of not just virus-infected cells, but healthy tissue. It's that inflammatory response that ends up being deadly. Bats don't suffer the same fate. Bats can defend themselves, launch this inflammation, but they don't go overboard. Okay, so this is a, a, a very big area of research and I think we human can learn. Linfa says he's convinced bats offer important insights into the regulation of the immune system that may inform ways the human body can better tackle COVID-19 and other viral diseases. So my slogan now is uh, my study is basically learning from bats. Bats have so much to teach us. For one thing, Linfra is intrigued that a species of bat that weighs just 7 grams has a heart that beats more than 1,000 times per minute during flight. It flies for 5 to 8 hours daily and can live for 43 years. This is 
all down with the, the same heart, without any medication, without any you know, hygiene. You know, imagine that, right? It's incredible. It's little wonder that Linfa is working with cardiologists who study the heart muscles of bats. Just one of a number of medical disciplines he's recruited into his bat pack. I have been able to mobilize not only infection disease people, genomic people, immunologists, and the cancer biologists, and now cardiologists are collaborating with me to study bat. My personal dream, you have enough money, is to establish a bat institute. I think we have lots to learn from bat. Bats can help us identify what viruses of pandemic potential are lurking in nature, as well as ways we might be able to mitigate their threat. They're just one example of how humans are profoundly affected by what happens in global ecosystems. To anticipate, prevent, and respond to disease threats like COVID-19 means taking an increasingly wide-angled look at the natural world. And that's it for this special episode of the Prognosis Daily Edition. For more on the pandemic from our bureaus around the world, visit Bloomberg.com slash coronavirus. And if you like the podcast, please take a moment to rate us and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It helps more listeners find our global reporting. The Prognosis Daily Edition is hosted by me, Laura Carlson. The show is produced by me, Topher Forges, Jordan Gaspore, and Magnus Henriksen. Reporting by Jason Gale. Original music by Leo Sidrin. Our editors are Francesca Levy and Rick Schein. Francesca Levy is Bloomberg's head of podcasts. Thanks for listening. Listening.